Hi, this is Archie. I'm back for the ADHDK podcast. I have a special guest uh, joining me virtually. I have uh, Professor Stephen Farone, who is well-renowned in the world of ADHD for his research. He's worked in, uh, in the ADHD field for so many years, qualifying um, as, a, as a psychologist and specialising in, um, in ADHD, as I said. So we are going to be discussing all things ADHD today on this, um, on this podcast with uh, Dr. Farone. So... Let me see if I can bring him into the onto the call. Okay, oh, there you go. On. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> How are okay. you? Okay, I'm doing fine, young man. And and your name is? Um, I'm Archie. Archie. Okay, Archie. Yeah, nice Archie. Yes. Yeah. So, so I'm Archie. I um I'm a clinician. We're based in the UK. I uh, I run a, a private specialist clinic that specialises in all things ADHD. So we do assessments, okay. we do diagnosis, and we do treatment so we you know prescribe okay. medication we have a couple of coaches as well that work with us and we Great. run lots of workshops and we do webinars and we do podcasts as well which is this Great. platform here uh, so Great. our podcast is called the uh, the adhd care podcast very nice and where in the uk are you uh we are in surrey it's a place called guildford i don't know if you know surrey which is more surrey just is... Up, not far from london very good very good. Yeah, so just literally on the outskirts is about half an hour from London. Yeah, I just saw an article, I think it was in The Guardian, about there being not enough ADHD care, so a lot of the uh, supplement co companies are taking advantage of it by selling people basically supplements that don't work for their ADHD because they can't get yeah. treatment. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the shortage of medication, and I'm, I'm sure it's yeah. the same uh, offer in the States, but yeah, it's... Yeah. It's it's really uh, unsettling our clients, and and it has been for for the last few months. So yeah, um, I was hoping to kind of get your take on that one on, on that subject as well. So um, sure. we sure. are we are not broadcasting live, so this is being recorded. So if there's anything that you want me to edit afterwards, just just let me know. Okay, that's great. Uh, you could also let your audience know about my website adhdevidence.org. That's a place okay. for the public to learn about ADHD. I think you'll like it if you haven't seen it yet. Excellent. Right. Okay. Perfect. And uh, yeah, I'll check it out myself as well. Um, I met you at the um, the Congress, the one in Amsterdam okay, last in yes. May. Yeah. I briefly sort of bumped into you and we had a quick yes. chat. But because um, you're giving a talk over there, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I'm president of the association, so I, yeah, I, I, oh, right. <laughs> I have a lot to do there. <laughs> oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and uh, I, I, okay, I went to the international conference on ADHD as well in the States uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, that was which, held which one in was this now? The, uh, the one from Chad, the Chad conference. Oh, the Chad meeting, yes, that's the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a very well-known meeting. For sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So excellent. So I'll um I'll just give you kind of a quick rundown of what I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so I want to just talk obviously about research. Uh, I want to talk about some of the the treatment options available for ADHD, and obviously some of our audience as well. They're quite um new to to the world of ADHD. So yeah. maybe I wanted to cover around kind of the brief overview around what is ADHD, and certainly okay. from uh, if that's all right with you. And also we can look at um, how you've seen um, ADHD, particularly from the research point of view, evolve over the last number of years okay. and where we are now. And also, um, yeah, and just get your kind of take home messages at the end of this. If there's anything else you want to share with our, with our listeners, okay. by all means you Very can. Good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Perfect. So, okay. So. Do you want me to call you Professor Farron? Do you want me to call you Stephen? Do you want me to call you Steve? What would you prefer? Whatever your standard is on the podcast, that's okay. Okay. All right. I'll 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 make it formal. I'll just call you Professor okay. Farron if that's okay. right with you. That's, that's fine. So I'm um, really honored for um to have you on our podcast, um, Professor Farron. And um yeah, I I'm 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 really interested uh, in us discussing about this fascinating topic on ADHD. As you know, there's so many um, facets and avenues we can go down this route with uh, when you talk about ADHD. Um, first of all, I just wanted to um, ask you in terms of like, if you are able to share with us what initially drew you to specialize in, in uh, ADHD? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I, sometimes I lecture young people going into 
into the clinical research world to, on this very topic. Uh, yeah. For me, it was a, uh, in some ways, it was a, a matter of a happenstance. I was a young faculty member at Harvard Medical School, uh, just connect, had just completed a fellowship in psychiatric epidemiology and genetics. Uh, at the time, was working um, in the area of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And then I met a someone who, who would become a lifelong colleague of mine, uh, Professor Joseph Biederman, who was also a young faculty member at, at Harvard Medical School. And he was looking for help uh, in his studies of ADHD as re regarding the genetic aspects of the disorder. So I started working with him and became intrigued with ADHD as a, as a disorder. I realized that there was a, back then, this was probably the early 1990s, late 1980s, we, I found out that relatively little was known about ADHD compared to other disorders. Childhood disorders, I found out, were really understudied compared to adulthood disorders. Um, and I just became intrigued with all the, of those problems. Um, I had in my clinical practice had seen kids with ADHD, um, of course, and this kind of consolidated it with me, made it got very intrigued with it. So it's it really set me on a lifelong career, which we're focused right. on ADHD now for, for the past 30 years. I was just about to ask how far back, how long ago was that when you yeah. when you first came into it's, this field? It's it's about 30 years ago. So wow. 19, early early 90s, 90, yeah, 30 years ago. Yeah. Right. And, and certainly over those years, how, how have you seen, what's your perception in terms of understanding ADHD and how it's evolved, particularly in the medical community over the last 30 years? Well, it's, it's changed dramatically. So, um, for example, when I started out, um, adult ADHD was barely recognized. It was not treated anywhere. In fact, we, we began to study it when we found that uh, adults were coming to our child psychiatry clinic in Boston because they couldn't get treatment for uh, their ADHD in any, any other place. And so we began a series of studies. Other people in the United States, uh, people like uh, Russell Barkley and others, uh, people in, in Europe began to study, like Philip Asherson in, in the UK. Uh, now, of course, adult ADHD is is fully recognized by di the diagnostic manuals as being a disorder. Uh, yeah. It's still not as well recognized as it ought to be in among healthcare professionals around the world. And so we are doing some education about that. That's one been one big change. We've learned a lot about the genetics and neurobiology of the disorder. Uh, again, back in the 1980s, 1990s, there were hints that there was a biological component, but there was a lot of blaming the parents, blaming the teachers, uh, saying that kids were lazy, they weren't trying hard enough. Some people claim, even to this day, that it's, it's not really a disorder uh, at, at all. So uh, our group and uh, a number of other colleagues from around the world began to do uh, studies that now, you know, fast forward 30 years, uh, there's no doubt that there's a ADHD has a very strong genetic component. Heritability is about 80%. Um, it's one of the most heritable disorders in all of psychiatry. Uh, we now have some good leads on some of the genes that are involved in ADHD. We've also come to understand that it's not a, uh, a disorder that has a simple cause. So back when I, in the, when I was designing genetic studies back in the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, we were hoping that maybe we would discover one, two, three, four, maybe five genes that would explain ADHD. And if that was the case, it would open up the possibility of some of a relatively easy path to discovering new treatments for it. That's not the case. We know now that um, the gen genetic aspects of ADHD are highly, what we say, polygenic, meaning many, many, many genes are work together in concert cumulatively to push people over the threshold where they become uh, impaired with the symptoms of ADHD. In fact, in our latest publication, we estimated that approximately 7,000 genes might be involved. Wow, wow. And certainly when you talk, yeah, because I, um, that's something I'm very fascinated about, certainly when you talk about the genes, um, that's something that some, some of our listeners might not be so familiar with. Would you mind just spending some time with me just discussing around the, the kind of the brain and the chemicals in the brain and things? Um, would you like, the best ways you can, you can try and simplify it for our listeners as well. So um, what, what happens with ADHD in the brain? So first of all, we have to remember that we're still at early days of understanding all the mechanisms in the brain that are leading to ADHD symptoms. So I want you listeners to understand that, that we have to be patient, that research takes a long time. 
But we do know we have some hints. So for example, the medications that work in ADHD work in the either the dopamine system of the brain or the norepinephrine system of the brain. Dopamine and norepinephrine are two chemicals. They're chemicals we call neurotransmitters. They help brain cells communicate with one another. Uh, so for example, everybody has heard of Ritalin and Adderall. Uh, those are two stimulant medications. And one of the effects that they have is that they, um, they block a protein in the brain called the dopamine transporter. Uh, we think that some people with ADHD may have too many of these dopamine transporters and that because they have too many of them, uh, the, the signal from one brain cell to the next brain cell uh, is not clear. And the lack of clarity is something that causes the symptoms. And we think that happens in centers of the brain that are involved uh, in areas of self-regulation. There are parts of the brain that um, in, the, in the front part of our brain called the frontal lobes who, that, that control help us uh, to control our behaviors, help us to regulate our behaviors. So at, at a very core level, ADHD is a disorder of uh, self-regulation. Most of us, most people in the world are able to regulate their behaviors. They can regulate their attention from one point to the next, no difficulty. They can focus on the teacher at school. They can focus on what their boss is saying at work. But when attention is dysregulated, when that inability to regulate goes away, uh, all of a sudden, the person becomes very distractible. The same thing is true for behavior. When behavior is self-regulated, the child can sit down in his chair. When they can't self-regulate, they fidget, they move about, uh, they climb on furniture. Uh, the adult may pace around in a conference room and they should be sitting sitting around. Uh, so the areas of the brain that we believe are involved are these areas of the brain that are involved in self-regulation. Now we have neuroimaging studies that have imaged the brain. And what, they've, what they document is that people, on, on average, people with ADHD have what we would call very, I like to call them brain differences. There are small differences in the brains of people with and with that ADHD. But they're not so big that, for example, if you went to see your doctor and he did a brain scan, they, well, you wouldn't see it on a brain scan because they're very tiny differences. It's just that these small differences accumulate and we believe leads to a dysregulation uh, of the brain. But a, a lot more to be understood in how, how that exactly occurs. We know from genetic studies that uh, genes that are, it's very likely that genes that are, are uh, involved in, develop, in developing the brain early on from birth are involved in ADHD. Uh, there's a, we could we could talk for a long time about genetic studies, but the short story is that there's you know decades of work now that shows that ADHD has a very strong uh, genetic uh, component to it. And and for us clinicians as well, that's something that because obviously when we diagnose ADHD is based on uh, you know observations, taking a full history, using some rating scales. If you fast forward to a number of years from now, would you ever see um, maybe scans being used to be able to recognize if someone might potentially have ADHD, particularly to, to work out in terms of what we're discussing with the um, the chemicals in the brain? In some ways, it's the holy grail of psychiatry to come up with objective tests for psychiatric problems because yeah. uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, mental health professionals, we're all criticized for having so-called subjective measures of diagnoses. Yeah, you're right. Uh, Many of us are working on those things right now. My team is, is trying to work on more objective approaches using genetics, for example. Uh, I don't think, uh, I'm pretty sure I'll just say this is not going to be available anytime soon. It may be maybe 10 years from now. It will take a, It's going to take a while, but it, it may be the case that eventually, 10 years from now, we have enough genetic information or enough information from Im imaging that we can make a diagnosis that's as good or better than yeah. a clinician can make. But you readers need to understand that when they hear criticisms of the diagnostic process as being subjective because it's just a bunch of questions, that it's a mistake to worry about it because we know from a lot of research that the diagnoses of ADHD are highly trustworthy. And they're trustworthy because they've been studied, they've been shown to be highly, we say reliable, meaning two experts will agree who does and doesn't have ADHD. And they're highly valid. They have a lot of what we call predictive validity. They predict lots of important things in a person's life, and they're very useful for guiding treatment. So uh, these, these diagnoses may be subjective in the sense that they're based on questions that someone asks, but they are uh, actually as good or better than some so-called objective diagnoses. In fact, there, hmm. there's actually papers that show that the diagnosis of, of 
ADHD or other psychiatric conditions is actually better than diagnosing hypertension from a blood pressure cuff because the measurement of blood pressure is highly unreliable. It's influenced by so many other different factors uh, in, a person, in a person's life. Uh, but that's a long period. That's another long story to get into. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people are familiar, or some people anyway, um, going back to the brain that we discussed in before, um, dopamine, noradrenaline, those are some of the chemicals that a lot of people hear. I'll come to the treatment medication later on, but I just wanted to, for you to just maybe explain to our listeners in terms of what are these chemicals and how are they linked with ADHD? So the, 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 the chemicals have been linked to ADHD because of the way the drugs work. That was the first hint when we, when we realized that these drugs were effective. You have to remember that the drugs for ADHD were discovered by chance. First amphetamine was discovered in what, 1937 in Rhode Island. That was a total accident. Uh, so then Ritalin was discovered again. It was found to work in ADHD. Uh, the mechanism of action of these drugs are, are what tells us that norepinephrine and dopamine are involved in the brain of people with ADHD. That's how we, we know it. And again, it's because these chemical messages aren't getting through properly. They're not communicating. Brain cells aren't communicating properly. It's like a, you know, imagine you're, you know, when you're listening to, a, a, well, people might be listening to this podcast and all of a sudden their internet connection is degraded and it gets kind of fuzzy. Okay, they can't communicate, you know, you're not communicating well with them, they're missing something. That's what's happening in the brain. There's a fuzzy communication going on. Um, and that's when the symptoms of ADHD, we believe, emerge. Yeah. And that doesn't explain the cause of ADHD. That's that's kind of like the end state, it's where people end up. We think that early on in development, other things are happening as the brain is growing, as the brain is getting wired, if you will, to, for action. Uh, some of the some of the wiring is getting miswired. And these chemicals aren't, uh, the neurons maybe aren't going into the right place or they're not connecting the way they, they should be. Um, that's, we have a lot to learn about that, but some of the genetic data suggests that's the case, that these the genes that are involved in the developing brain are very important for causing ADHD. Um, if we think about, when you think about the ADHD symptoms themselves, obviously most people are familiar with uh, inattention symptoms, hyperactivity, mm -hmm. impulsivity. Um, I'll come down to the uh, to talk about the myths that some people have misconceptions about ADHD that we often hear, even in the media. That's still mm -hmm. there. Um, that it's been used as an excuse. You know, we all you know have issues around concentration, focusing, and all of that stuff. So, um, I suppose with all, all of what we discussed in there, how 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 does the ADHD or one come to, to a clinician that is who's assessing is able to differentiate between? an individual who's struggling with maybe stress, anxiety, other issues, environmental, compared to them having genuinely having something like ADHD in this case? Sure. How, how well, can they differentiate? Let's take the let's take environmental causes. Okay. So in some cases, say a child is in a very chaotic family, uh, they may have a lot of ADHD-like symptoms uh, because of their chaotic family. But usually what, what in those cases, the symptoms of the child are, are basically at home. They're not occurring in school. Once they go to school and they're away from that chaotic family, the school environment's well-structured, they do, they do okay. And one of the requirements for, the, for a person being diagnosed with ADHD is that the symptoms are pervasive. They're occurring in, well, the diagnostic criteria say they have to occur in at least two parts of a person's life, two important domains of a person's life. The kid that's usually at home in school, for adults, it's typically home and work, but it could be other domains. If it's only occurring one place, then it's not ADHD, it's something else. And that's that's where the environment comes in. There's this other issue about, oh, everybody's sometimes inattentive. Everybody can get a little fidgety and hyperactive. Well, that's like saying everybody has a blood pressure, so nobody has hypertension, or everybody has a cholesterol level, so nobody needs to worry about um, their cholesterol levels. Um, it is true that the symptoms of ADHD at lower levels occur in other people. But part of the, 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 diagnos the diagnosis occur is, is made not just based on the symptoms. The symptoms have to cause serious impairments in the person's life. Uh, we don't, you don't diagnose ADHD just because a child, you know, a parent clicks off uh, six symptoms of hyperactivity or inattention. Um, as you know, what the clinician does is those, those symptoms are evident. And also what many people in the real world out there don't understand is that when patients come in for help, they usually come in complaining of something. And what they're complaining about is it's usually not 
the, the symptoms of ADHD. The parent doesn't usually come in and say, my child is not attentive. They usually come in and say, my child is failing in school. My child's not paying attention to me. My child's getting into struggles with his uh, mates or his, uh, his, his siblings. And it's those kinds of impairments that are caused by the symptoms. That's what drives the diagnosis. So it's, it's symptoms plus impairment. Without impairment, uh, we, the symptoms are not considered to be diagnostic, even if they're endorsed by the patient or the parent. Um, if we fast forward to now, to where we are 2023, um, th th there's much more, I would say the awareness of ADHD is growing. Certainly if you go on social media now, there's, you know, mm -hmm. there's posts and people talking openly about the experiences and things, which in a way is good because it's raising awareness of ADHD and it's reaching out to people that probably didn't know about ADHD or didn't really think about, about it in to that extent. But at the same time, it's raising, it's kind of feeding into these misconceptions that we were discussing that, now everyone can just go on TikTok or Instagram and hear something and they think they might have ADHD. So what? Yeah, what's what's your views on that, just in terms of like so where one, we are now? The, yeah, one of the big problems with social, well, there's a few problems with social media. So there are some, some social media sites are just out and out giving false information. That's bad. Uh, there, there are other social media sites which are typically first with ADHD talking about their experiences. And those that's fine. I think it's actually great that people share. But what happens sometimes is that people listening to those uh, influencers, anything they say about their lives, the, the listeners think is ADHD. So for example, somebody with ADHD, with, who really has ADHD who's talking about their life might talk about anxiety in their life, have a, though there's anxiety problems. And somebody who, ha who has an anxiety problem hears that and thinks, oh, I have ADHD because I have anxiety. When in fact, they might not have ADHD. They might, they might actually have an anxiety disorder that's is treated totally different from ADHD. So they go into their doctor and they complain. The doctor says, you don't have ADHD. They get confused because they made the mistake of thinking just because the social influencer had the problem, it was part of their ADHD. Now, this gets to be a little bit more of a problem because people who have ADHD tend to have other problems. We call, we call that psychiatric comorbidity. The person has more than one disorder. It's true of any mental health problem. If you have one mental health problem, your odds of having a second one are higher than average. And so it's hard for a person out in the world listening to social media to know what aspects of this person's life is relevant to me having ADHD. Another good example would be, and I, I know this because I, I've done some uh, Ask Me Anything sessions on Reddit where I, I get a lot of questions from people with ADHD. And for example, you know, one writer there talked about, asked me about gender dysphoria. Is gender dysphoria a part of ADHD? Well, well, no, it's not. I mean, some people with ADHD have gender dysphoria, but just because they talk about their gender dysphoria doesn't mean that's part of their ADHD. It yeah. means it's another problem that they happen to have. And so I would, what I would urge listeners is that if you think you have ADHD, learn about the symptoms of the disorder. There are many good websites. My website, ADHDevidence.org is one place. Our, the U.S. National Institutes of Mental Health Another good site. I'm sure you have good sites in the UK as well that people can go to where uh, they can get really solid information on how, what is a diagnosis of ADHD as opposed to an associated feature that might occur in some people with ADHD and but not in others. Yeah. Um, if we think about the diagnosis of ADHD, I think we talked about the lack of objective element to it. Um, in your opinion, how can you how, how can that be improved going forward, like over the next years? So, what would you like to see happening in terms of for us clinicians that would help us to be sure, able to diagnose sure. and recognize ADHD in individuals? So first, I, first I'll say number one, the diagnosis right now is 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 actually very good. Does it? We, we it's it's valid in the sense that I've, I've written actually papers about this. Understanding ADHD is a valid diagnosis. People can read about this. Uh, it's valid because it predicts important things. If you know, the people listening have to understand when you go see a mental health clinician, they're making a diagnosis because that diagnosis is going to tell them what to do to help you. And we know a diagnosis is good if most of the time when we make that diagnosis, we get a good treatment outcome. And that's the case with ADHD diagnosis. But of course, they can be improved. How can they be improved? Well, we already said someday, maybe we'll get an objective diagnosis. But that's in the future. I think probably the biggest area where we can improve diagnosis has to do with diagnosing ADHD in adults. Uh, the diagnoses in children have, um, have been around for quite a long time and, and proven themselves. 
But what happened was that the diagnosis in adults were basically based on, on criteria that we use for kids that were then retrofitted for adults. That changed a little bit in the fifth edition of the US Diagnostic Manual. Um, and now we have a very big change in the ICD-11, which if you want, we can talk about later uh, as well. If we stick right now with the American system, which is based upon a strict set of criteria, you know, you have to have, if you're a child, you have to have six of nine symptoms of inattentions or and or six of nine symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity. What's missing in the diagnostic criteria for adults is the problems of emotional dysregulation. And we talked before I, about how ADHD is essentially a disorder of self, uh, inability to self-regulate, inability to self-regulate cognitions and behavior are already in the criteria, but inability to self-regulate emotions do not occur in the criteria. I think that's particularly important for adults because as people with ADHD get older, they tend to get less hyperactive, a little less impulsive, they get more attentive, but we start to see more symptoms of emotional dysregulation but they don't count towards a diagnosis. So some people with ADHD can't get a diagnosis because they don't actually meet the criteria based upon the official uh, criteria in, in, the diagnostic, in the diagnostic manual. So there have been suggestions that future editions of the diagnostic manual evolve, but there's, there is debate about that because any change is makes a big change for clinicians in the field, which creates problems. So it's not it's not an easy thing to do, but it is something that has been under, under discussion. Yeah. Like what you said there, we've discussed on this podcast a lot around emotional dysregulation, and that's something, like what you said, that's um, not really associated a lot. Most people don't really associate that with ADHD. And in some cases, in our clinic, we see some people coming in, being diagnosed with another sort of like a mood disorder, which is... That's what been happens, what's right. thought as yeah. it's that's causing why they're having these rapid mood swings and things, which you know in some cases could possibly possibly be uh, be ADHD. I think linked with that, you've got the executive functioning. Um, I think emotional dysregulation kind of falls in that sort of category as well, doesn't it? That there's not much that's been spoken around executive functioning, and when you look at the diagnostic criteria, when you look at the actual symptoms of ADHD themselves, when you apply them to adults. Um, they might, some of them might apply, but some of them doesn't really capture what we see in an adult. One of them being right. like what you said, emotional dysregulation. You got the, you know, the um, the sluggish uh, cognitive temple as well. The uh, the SCT kind of issues that some people might present with. Um, the term itself, ADHD. Again, I've discussed this on, on this podcast. It can be quite misleading because people think when they hear ADHD, a lot of people say to me. I don't have higher productivity, but yet they have the mind racing. They've got all of these other, right. not as hyperactive physically that you'd associate with a child, but it's still classed as age and hyperactivity, as you know, when you look at adults, that it could right. be that they struggle right. with switching off. Their mind is always busy. They can't relax, all of that, which when you look at the criteria, it doesn't really capture that. Yeah, in fact, now the, one, the, now the criterion for, one of the criteria for hyperactivity for adults, it says it's, it's, it will be a symptom if the person is, is uh, uncomfortable in situations where uh, being still is required. So if somebody, for example, has a hard time sitting, we, we've all been, well, I shouldn't say we all, many, those of us who go to meetings in big conference rooms where you're supposed to sit around the table for an hour or two, it's not, if it's a big, big enough meeting, one or two people will get up and pace around the room. They'll have a cup of coffee, they'll walk around, and those people might have ADHD because they're uncomfortable. They just don't like to sit still. They don't like that kind of environment. And they tend to seek out jobs where they don't have to actually sit around for a while. But they're not frankly hyperactive. They're not running around and climbing on furniture. Now, the DSM in the United States, that's our diagnostic manual, they try to, to adapt to adults. The other thing they did was to reduce the number of criteria from six, uh, six of nine symptoms to, six, to five of nine symptoms. Uh, it actually turns out that reducing it to four would probably make more sense. That's another ish area of debate is whether it should be lower. If you're going to keep the same childhood-based criteria, it probably should be four, not five, because data that I've collected and other people have collected around the world suggest that's more of a valid um, criterion for adults. You mentioned executive dysfunction, and um, I'm glad you brought that up because emotional dysregulation is kind of a subset of executive dysfunction, but it is a broader concept that involves all, all the ways in which the, the frontal lobes of our brain uh, re regulate our behaviors and cognitions. And people with ADHD 
a very difficult time, or if you will, in, in a very broad sense, organizing their lives in, in, at, at every level. And the ability, this, this inability to self-organize uh, is causes a lot of these executive function type symptoms that are not well captured in the current criteria. And I think could be, uh, could be added in future versions. How about our rejection sensitivity dysphoria? What's your take on that, RSD? Uh, it's it is a it's not a symptom of ADHD. People with ADHD may experience that. I, I don't, it hasn't been well studied, so I don't I can't can't even tell you if it's more common in people with ADHD than uh, than other people. It may it may very well be, but it, it, we wouldn't say that's a, a symptom of ADHD. It's certainly not ready for prime time as going into a diagnostic manual because it it just hasn't been studied. I, periodically, I've gone to the, if you go to the national the U.S. National Library of Medicine. By the way, that's pubmed.gov. It's a great source of, of scientific data about ADHD. Um, you don't find very much there at all about rejection sensitive dysphoria and ADHD, but it's something for the future to look at because uh, it is an area, it is an issue that's being discussed a lot by people with ADHD. And one thing that you know, researchers have to listen to is people who have the disorder because they we can learn yeah. from them. Yeah. We can learn about what we need to study and, and know more about. Mm. Yeah, so I've seen. I've seen it evolve throughout the years I've worked in in ADHD and the the knowledge the the terms that are that we're talking about now like all of this uh, you know executive dysfunction if I think back to like 20 years ago we weren't really putting much emphasis around executive dysfunction back then it was just typically looking at the three symptoms of ADHD and just accept, right. accepting them as, as as they are but now we understand the, it's it's quite a complex presentation when someone presents with the difficulties controlling their impulsivity uh, right. That could be associated with the, you know, the emotional dysregulation and the link between that. So, yeah, so that's fascinating. Um, just again, going forward to the treatment side of things, I think we touched on earlier about medication. So yes. uh, just linking in with what we're discussing in terms of what happens in the brain. So how does the medication, uh, what's the role of the medication, certainly in terms of managing ADHD, and certainly from a kind of neurobiological point of view, what happens in the brain if someone is okay. taking medication? So, uh, in most uh, treatment guidelines, the medication is considered to be a we, we call a first line treatment, meaning it's the first thing that you do. Uh, there are exceptions, for example, um, parents who don't want their kids on medication. Obviously, you're not going to give a kid a medication. Um, there are for very young children, preschool children. Um, some guidelines call for trying behavior therapy first before you use medication, uh, even though behavior therapy actually isn't validated as a treatment for ADHD. Um, but for the most part, for most people with ADHD, the medications will be tried first. There are two broad classes, stimulants and non-stimulants. And to keep it simp simple, the st stimulants are drugs that work in the dopamine system primarily. And the non-stimulants primarily work in the neurogenergic system, although they do have other effects. Some of the, um, uh, some of the, particularly some of the newer drugs have effects on also on dopamine. The newer non-stimulants have effects on dopamine and possibly serotonin as, as well. But we believe that the biggest effects are occurring in the neurogenergic system uh, of the brain. Now, in the non-stimulants, there are two actually two big classes. One are those that are primarily work on a protein called the norepinephrine transporter that transports neuroadrenaline around the brain, and the other is a set of of drugs are called alpha two agonists. These are drugs that uh, basically uh, activate a, a brain receptor called the alpha two receptor, which works in the neurogenergic uh, system of the brain. So again, so yeah, so if someone is on medication, so how, how do, because I, I remember watching a video that uh, I always recommended for my clients to see, I think it's actually on YouTube actually, where, which breaks it down in terms of, okay, you've taken your medication. This is how your brain works when you're not on medication. This is how your brain works in terms of the, the blocking, the reuptake of those chemicals that we were discussing earlier. So from, a, from that point of view, what would you, if you were to simplify it for our listeners, to, to explain the whole process of what happens when this when they take the medication. Um, I can share the link in terms of the video I'm referring to yeah. in the, in yeah, the podcast so, description. So basically, so, we, the patient takes the medication, the doctor gets it to the right dose, which is sometimes tricky in the right medication. It can take time. There's a little bit of what we call educated trial and error uh, that to get, it's important that it gets to the right dose so that you have good a good uh, reduction of symptoms, but not too many adverse effects that bother you. At that point, for example, if you're taking a stimulant medication, it means that the 
the drug is working in the doping system to improve the transmission, uh, the communication between cells, brain cells, which which has the effect of improving the person's ability to self regulate to regulate their behavior. And they find they can attend better, they can sit still, they can focus on their work, uh, whatever the their ADHD symptoms had been, uh, they they are reduced. And that usually they don't go away completely. Um, and I always like to remind people, especially adults who have had ADHD untreated for many years, that uh, pills don't replace skills. They're very important for ADHD treatment, don't get me wrong, but they can't replace a lifetime of not learning other skills to improve your life. And other um, non-medical, non-medication treatments are needed to help you develop those kinds of skills that can really move you forward. But a good uh, approach to thinking about treatment is get on a get on an appropriate ADHD medication for you at the right dose. Evaluate with your clinician how well things are going. Find the areas where things aren't going well, and then try to improve those by we call adjunct treatments, extra treatments, add-ons that can help you do better. It could be coaching, could be cognitive behavior therapy for adults. Yeah. Uh, for kids, it might be family behavior therapy and so forth. Yeah. A little question that that um, I often hear people say, particularly if they're not they're quite new to the field of ADHD, particular medication. They say, "Why are we giving people stimulants when they are already stimulated because of having ADHD?" So they'll take it in a yeah. literal sense of taking a yeah. stimulant, basically. So it's it's an unfortunate name for the class of drugs. I, I would much prefer yeah. that they call them dopamine reuptake inhibitors because that's what they do. They stop the reuptake of dopamine to cells, but we're stuck with this name stimulants. Um, and one way to think about it is that uh, these drugs are stimulating a part of the brain that is understimulated. And so this part of the brain that's underactive needs to be more active. And that's yeah. helping the person uh, who has ADHD or the child become less hyperactive if they happen to have hyperactivity. Yeah, It's, it's a little it, confusing, but I would say don't even worry about the name. It's just a, it's yeah. not, it's, it was a mistake to have to call it that. <laughs> If you were to redefine the name ADHD, in your view, what would you define it as? I know we can't. Uh, um, it's uh, it is what it is, but yeah, how would you describe ADHD in your view if you have to re? Wow, well, that's a, name it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, well, I'm not endorsing renaming it because that that would probably confuse things even further. But I would I, I would probably call it something like self regulation deficit disorder, uh, because. It covers all the areas of self-regulation that are deficient in people with ADHD. That, that's that's how I kind of view it. And it, it, it doesn't ha say inattentive. It doesn't say hyperactive impulsive. It doesn't say emotional. It's covering all this range of self uh, of difficulties in self-regulation. And self-regulation can apply to your focusing, to your impulse control, to your regulating your emotions. That's exactly right. That's exactly pretty right. Pretty much. That's basically it's covering everything, yeah. And if, you're, if your listeners think about ADHD as a sort of self-regulation, it helps them understand something else. And that is the uh, the waxing and waning of ADHD symptoms. The, the symptoms tend to be pervasive and chronic, but they're not always there. And what happens is think about your life that um, the environments that we go into um, present different challenges to self-regulation. If we're sitting at home watching television, there's not too much we have to do to self-regulate. We're just watching a television show. Uh, we may have to remember to go to bed at the right time or something like that. And, but for the most part, there's not strong uh, challenges to our self-regulatory abilities. We, On the other hand, the adult gets up in the morning, they go to work, they sit down at the desk and the boss comes over and throws a folder of papers on the desk and I want you to you know, summarize these for me and tell me what, what we should focus on for the next uh, fiscal year. Wow, all of a sudden your self-regulatory abilities are challenged dramatically. And that's when symptoms will start to emerge. And I encourage people with ADHD to think about part areas of their areas of their life where the challenges of self-regulation are high. And if those areas of life can be modified, that can sometimes be helpful. So if you have it, for example, a part of your life where there's a lot of challenges to self-regulation that you can get rid of, sometimes it's good just to get rid of that. Those those challenges because you don't they're causing you problems. Um, in other cases, you may have to just you may not be able to get rid of it because it's your livelihood or it's it's something else. In that cases, you definitely need to find help 
uh, perhaps through cognitive behavior therapists or coaching to be able to rise to those challenges if the medication isn't doing a good enough job. Um, and also keep in mind that not every not every prescriber is equally proficient at prescribing medication. And if you think your prescriber maybe isn't doing a good job uh, because maybe your dose isn't high enough or they you know, they tell you something stupid, like, well, I only use one medication because it works for everybody. There are prescribers mm -hmm. who say, that, oh, I only use methylphenidate because, you know, it works for everybody. Yeah, now, I do recognize that the drugs available in different countries are also different. Your people in the UK, you don't have the same drugs we have in the United States, but yeah. you have a range of drugs. You've got lisdexamphetamine, you've got atomoxetine, I believe, um, you've got methylphenidate. So uh, the typical practice is to find the best drug for the patient, not to uh, not to be happy with a drug that's just doing a, a modest effect on symptoms. You want to really, I encourage, I always encourage, encourage clinicians to seek optimal outcomes for their patients, not just good outcomes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you it, it, it goes without saying that your your research has contributed significantly to helping uh, us understand about ADHD over the number of years. Has, has there been any interesting or uh, findings just from your research over the years that you've encountered at all? Well, it's all been very fascinating. I mean, the, the part of my work um, had led to this discovery of polygenic variation in ADHD. That's uh, with me and a, a team of international researchers. That was an important breakthrough in ADHD for sure. Um, my team did some of the seminal work in adult ADHD where we helped to redefine the diagnostic criteria. That was, ex I think, ex extremely, extremely important. Um, we're doing some work right now trying to, to do um, predictive modeling to predict which people with ADHD are at higher risk for adverse outcomes. Um, there's an area of work I'm involved with right now with the European Consortium called TimeSpan. It's, it's headed by Henrik Larsson in, at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. And, uh, and what uh, we're doing there is we're documenting that not only does people, are people with ADHD at high risk for other psychiatric problems, but they're also at higher risk for other medical disorders that aren't psychiatric. So disorders like, for example, diabetes, hypertension, um, some other cardio uh, metabolic diseases, obesity is another example. Um, there are connections between, if you will, kind of between the, the brain and the rest of the body that is somehow putting people at AD, with people with ADHD at risk for these other problems. And it's not simply um, because of their symptoms. So some people say, of course, ADHD people can get obese because they, you know, they're impulsive, they impulsively eat, or they don't pay attention to their diet. And that's true, and it probably has an effect, but we're also showing that the um, there are shared genetics between ADHD and obesity. So some of the genes that are causing ADHD are also causing obesity and vice versa. So we think there's actually also a biological link between the, uh, between uh, ADHD and its somatic disorders. That, that's a that's a, a relatively new area that's growing fairly uh, fairly dramatically. So we have lots of interest, loads of interesting things that have come out uh, over the past what thirty plus years of doing research in this disorder. That's yeah, that that got me thinking there. Just I'm just trying to think from a medical point of view, like if someone's presenting with, uh, we know with, in terms of eating disorder, um, the link with to some extent with ADHD. That's I know there's been some sort of research that's been done around that. Do you see that in terms of, because obviously I'm, I'm all, you know, the, the link physical health uh, and ADHD, I think it's something that's not really been given the attention that it actually needs. And I agree with you. I think um, I see lots of, some of my patients have issues with blood pressure, for example. Um, but right. is that because of like what you said, because of their ADHD that's causing them to maybe not look after themselves well, or is there a proper, like something, under, you know, something that might be causing that hasn't been picked up. So, um, I'll be I'll be watching that you know where this kind of goes yeah. <laughs> with, with a very kind of close eye. So, um, so how how do you see kind of ADHD evolving, uh, particularly the treatment side of things in the future, the management of ADHD? Are we going to have more, for example, medications coming onto the market? Are we going to have more treatments available? Just from if you think about your research that you've been yeah. doing. Well, there definitely are. I mean, I'm, I myself don't do treatment research. I do consult with colleagues and companies that do treatment research. So I, I do know a bit about that. Um, there are new treatments coming on the market. Again, not all of these will be available in the UK. Uh, for example, in the United States, we have a new non-stimulant uh, called extended release veloxacine, which is kind of like atomoxetine, but has some uh, different effects that um, right. make it appealing for some patients. 
Uh, I expect there's another uh, drug being, uh, I think it'll be reviewed by the US FDA, that's our Food and Drug Administration this year, called sententafidine. Uh, that's also a non-stimulant. It's interesting because it has effects on dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine. Um, the clinical trial data look pretty good so far, and I think that will be approved. I'm guessing that's only a guess, but I'm guessing that'll be approved. Um, recently, there's been approved in the United States an amphetamine patch, a prodrug, a methylphenidate burst, methylphenidate prodrug, so it's kind of like lisdex amphetamine, but for methylphenidate. Lots of new drugs that have been, have been developed are currently in the pipeline for being, for being developed. Nothing... Um, question is, is there anything for drugs in something in terms of something that's dramatically new? Um, I suppose that the triple reuptake inhibitors would be dramatic, fairly dramatically new because it's a different mechanism of action. The same is true somewhat of uh, extended release fluoxazine, which has effects on serotonin as well as um, norepinephrine and, and, do and dopamine. There had been an interest, and to some degree still is in the US, of developing stimulant drugs, particularly amphetamines that are manipulation resistant, which means you can't grind it down into a powder and, and, and snort it or inject it to get high. And that doesn't happen a lot, but it happens enough for us to be concerned about it. We do know from tracking emergency room visits to hospitals in the United States that you know, there is a decent amount, a fair amount of deaths that occur and, and serious medical events that occur because people have taken Adderall and, you know, Round it up to a form where they can put it in their nose or inject it. So there have been attempts uh, in the U.S. too so far that have not been successful, uh, but I do I expect that there will be more attempts to do that in the future, and that, that will be an, play an important role because we have to worry about um, you know the stimulants are highly effective in treating ADHD, but we find with particularly with adolescents and young adults that um, if they can you know if they can get a Adderall tablet from one of their friends so they can stay up late studying or stay up late to party, they'll do that. We call that diversion and misuse. Yeah. And yeah. that's happening in the US at rates that are, you know, to me, worrying. Uh, it, I wouldn't call them an epidemic, but they're high enough that uh, society needs to be careful about it and cautious about it. Mm -hmm. um, so we need to develop methods to reduce that as much as possible. And I would say to your listeners, if you're people out there thinking about with, you know, whether you share your drugs with your friends or you try to get your friends ADHD medications, it's really a very bad idea. Because for example, when someone takes a medication for ADHD, they've been cleared by their physician as being medically okay to take that drug. Not everybody is medically okay. Some people have cardiac conditions. They shouldn't take drugs for a drug for ADHD because it could actually kill them or make their condition worse. So um, there are there are potential serious negative effects of fooling around with someone else's medication. Just because it was prescribed by a doctor for somebody else, it doesn't mean it's safe for you. It means it's safe for them. It doesn't mean it's safe for you. For you, it's just, you could, you have to think about it. It's just like any other illicit drug for you. Um, so be careful about that. Don't um, take it too lightly. The, the, yeah, the, the whole stimulant diversion has been something that's, as you know, that's been there for years. Um, it sounds like it's, it's, it's still quite an issue of, of in the state. Um, and the regulation around that, it can be quite challenging, isn't it? Um, and also in the UK, all, all of the ADHD medications, or well, the stimulants that is anyway, they are controlled. So yeah, it's it's harder to actually get the prescription and there's processes of you being able to get one in the first place and all of well, that. It's controlled in the US too. It's, it's, not, it's hard to get prescription in the US too. It's also controlled in the US. It's just that I, I, my colleagues, I suspect diversion occurs more than is suspected in the UK. Just partly it hasn't been studied a lot in the UK. I, I would bet that it's 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 greater than one. It's hard to believe that that kids in the UK haven't figured this out. <laughs> it's uh, it, it's there, but it's 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 been interesting to see in terms of the rates. Is yeah. is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I, I, I've come across it as well. I think certainly when I think about young students, certainly around exam time and all of that sort of thing. That yeah, things you know, medications is falling in the wrong hands, and um and and sometimes some of our clients they're very open about it, where they will you know they give. Yeah. The parents will give another child the medication that doesn't have ADHD, all of that. Right. So, yeah, it's it's definitely a concern. And j just in terms of going back to medication and how we see the treatment evolving yeah. over the coming years and things, um, as prescribers, what we find, we tend to combine some of the medications. So I might give someone a non-stimulant and alongside a stimulant. 
for example, if I use Guanfasi you know, or Inchinu, for example, I know um, some of, from personal experience, I've noticed that it can target more of the emotional dysregulation symptoms than what a stimulant would do. Would you ever see a, a time where we would have uh, something that would cover or address um, all of those kind of um, no, not well documented symptoms that we've been discussing around emotional dysregulation, rather than to, us having to do the whole kind of combining two treatments? Yeah, it's a you know no I don't know of anybody that's working on that right now. I, yeah. That was one of the goals of people developing the triple reuptake inhibitors because uh, the triple reuptake inhibitor can you know work in the dopamine system as well as the noradrenergic system. And so, yeah, for example, when sentenafinil comes out, um, it'll be kind of an interesting drug if it comes out because it's it 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 won't be scheduled. I think it'll, it'll be in the U.S. we call Schedule Four, so it'll be regulated not as but not as heavily as. Um, Ritalin or Adderall, methylphenidate or amphetamine, because it's not, it doesn't, its addictive potential is lower. Its a, its impact on dopamine is lower, but it does have an effect yeah. on dopamine. So, it it may it may fill that gap, um, but we don't know yet because the, the relevant research hasn't been done. When it gets into the hands of of prescribers, we'll know a lot more too. Mm. Yeah. Um, I should yeah, also mention the... that there. Well, go, I just don't want to forget to talk about so-called digital therapeutics at some point, but we can. Yeah. That's an, that's another area that's gro I think a growing area. Do, do you want to say yeah? It's, it's all right. Do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, yeah. So you know, there's yeah. been uh, growth in we an area we call digital therapeutics. That's every anything from using an app or a computer to present information to a person to help reduce their symptoms of ADHD. Um, some of them are very simple things like organizational apps that just help a person keep organized. I think those are great, you know, especially if you're using them with a coach or a cognitive behavior therapist. Um, those are, you know, there's, they can be they can be really useful. Um, many of these digital uh, novel therapeutics haven't been well studied, so I, I would caution people when they they hear about something, the first place to do is go to PubMed.gov. If it's not there, it means it hasn't been studied, and it's, you have no reason to think it's going to be worthwhile. Now, some of them have been studied. So, for example, there's a there's a, a computer game. Uh, that's called, I think the trade name is now Endeavor RX, marketed by a company called Achille, uh, helped oh, yeah. them design a clinical that. trial. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's an interesting, um, it's an interesting computer game because it actually um, changes the, uh, the child's attentional capacity uh, as measured by what's called a continuous performance test. It's a neuropsychological test. So we know from that that it changes the brain. And because of that, the FDA uh, our U.S. FDA, um, but it, they're not actually approved. In the U.S., we say that um, devices are cleared and drugs are approved. They're different pathways. But in any case, it's got the stamp of approval, if you will, from the FDA. Um, the problem with it is that it, in the clinical trials, it didn't uh, help the symptoms of ADHD. It uh, helped only this neuropsychological test. And so it's it, it hasn't had a lot of uptake uh, in the treating world because of that particular problem. Now, there's other um, individuals and companies are trying to develop similar types of, we call it gamified treatments. Um, some of them seem to hold promise as to treating symptoms of ADHD, but we won't know really until they do the actual uh, clinical trial that shows that. Um, mm. So I would say to people, be wary of something that's just marketed directly to you without any kind of data around it at all because it's probably worth it's probably worthless if there's no data out there uh, on it um but these i think i think they I, we're seeing I, I like to think of it as the beginning of a new era that somebody's going to fix crack this puzzle if you will the, for you know you may have heard of therapies like cognitive training or feedback they've been around for a long time they basically don't work for ADHD symptoms they they work sometimes for very targeted areas of cognitive functioning um, yeah. But in terms of dramatically reducing symptoms of ADHD, like medications, they're not useful um, at all. But um, I would I just say stay tuned because I do think uh, there will be some breakthroughs there. There's a new one. It's not a, it's not a, a game. Um, it's what we call a neurotherapeutic. There are a number of uh, therapeutics that are sort of directly try to change the brain through some kind of stimulation. There's a right. uh, there's a, a product produced by a company called Monarch, which is called Trigeminal Nerve Stimulation. Right. And a colleague of mine at UCLA did a very good clinical trial where he showed that 
you get a very strong effect in symptoms of ADHD with this trigeminal nerve stimulation. Basically, the child has to uh, get hooked up to a, it's a, it's a machine that's not too uh, unwieldy. I think it's done, it may be done at night, even though I forget the details. And it actually does reduce symptoms of ADHD. It's still, wow. it, it, the FDA has cleared it in the United States, but it's still preliminary in my mind because there's only been one clinical trial. And it ha right. we don't have a lot of real world testing yet, but I do think that has hope um, to be a non, if you will, non-pharmacologic, but biological treatment for ADHD. Mm. Um, you, you mentioned about uh, continuous performance tests there. So w one thing that spring to mind is those tests such as uh, QB tests um, that you might be familiar with in terms of from the assessment and diagnostic and monitoring treatment point of view, what's, what's your views on those kind of what objective tests, if you want to call them that? So from the point of view of diagnosis, it's really important that every, really it's more important for clinicians to understand this, patients too, potential patients, that the only way to make a diagnosis is somebody, help, some health professional is talking to you about the symptoms of ADHD and how they impair you in your daily life. It's the only way you can make a diagnosis. There's no test that can either rule in or rule out the diagnosis of ADHD. It's one of the biggest mistakes that's made in clinical practice. We see it in the US a lot. There's some, I'm a psychologist and I have some psychologist colleagues who think that, you know, they can rule out ADHD because the person does well on their neuropsychological test. That's wrong. Some kids with ADHD do fine on continuous performance tests. They do fine on QB tests. They do fine on neuropsychological tests. And there are people who do poorly on those tests who don't have ADHD. So the tests are not useful for diagnosis. Um, if I speak broadly of neuropsychological tests, uh, they can be very useful post-diagnosis and, and really post-treatment for two reasons. One, one reason is to um, understand what are the remaining deficits after the child's been treated uh, as, as, uh, as much as optimally as the clinician can do. And in many cases, the neuropsychological tests gives very valuable hints as to what types of educational programs could be useful. They might give an adult information of what type of job they might be good at. Lots of useful information can come out of a test uh, for uh, helping the patient uh, progress in life. Uh, you mentioned monitoring treatment response. Some people do use uh, tests, uh, CPT-like tests, uh, TOVA or uh, QB test to monitor treatment response. That's useful. Uh, it's also very simple to use to ask the symptoms of ADHD. It's probably the most straightforward way. Um, there are rating scales. You mentioned them early on. Rating scales, again, they don't make, they're not useful for diagnosis. Uh, they can be useful to help to guide the clinician's interview because the clinician has the rating scale data and it helps them ask questions to the patient. And then after, um, d d through the process of treatment, if every time the patient comes in, they fill out the rating scale and or the doctor asks the questions about the symptoms that are most impairing, that's another way to monitor outcomes. That that would be my way to monitor outcomes, just to ask about the symptoms and the impairments that they're causing, because that's what that's what's important to the patient. Yeah, absolutely. Getting uh, getting feedback certainly in the case of uh, young people, if you can get feedback from school as well from different sources, similar to what we would have done initially when you were doing the assessment. So yes, um, and certainly touching on the rating scales point of view there, um. I, I personally like to use the rating scales that also uh, evaluate uh, executive functioning or just general yes. functioning impairments. So yes. that's not something that I see a lot in other clinics. They'll focus on the symptoms, but not really the functioning side of things. So, uh, for example, the brief, I use the brief quite a lot in, in our clinic as well, which also captures in, in addition to the symptoms. Good. Yeah, yes. yeah. So... Um, any, any, um, any, any, um, oh, on, on that point, actually. So we mentioned about the brief, any other rating scales that you might want to inform us or any other clinical uh, specialists listening that you so, use I in mean, your clinic? For, for, for children, you have, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has what's called the Vanderbilt rating scale, which has the advantage of it being free for anybody to use. It's, uh, that's simply a rating scale of sim symptoms of ADHD. Uh, for adults, there's the adult self-report. Uh, scale, ASRS, uh, out of NYU. Uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that's, I know they charge, they charge companies to use. I think it's, for, I think it might be free for clinicals, for clinicians to use in their practice. So I'd have to, you have to check with NYU on that. Um, but that's also, that's a very useful scale for adults. In terms of pay for scales, there's the Connors rating scale, which is a classic uh, 
for many years that covers ADHD, uh, also covers oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, and some impairments of ADHD. One one scale that I've always liked is the child uh, the child behavior checklist. It's part of a suite of scales called the ASEBA system, A S E B A, and I think you can if you Google that you'll find it. Uh, these have been uh, produced by a psychologist named Tom Achenbach, the University of Vermont. And very good work validating them, showing that they're culturally insensitive across many cultures and languages, translated to many languages. There's versions for parents and teachers and children and adults. Um, what's very nice about these is that it, they don't just cover ADHD, they cover the full range of child, of child and adult psychopathology, depending upon you know, who you're addressing. And, and I like it especially, because, especially for kids because you have to remember that frequently ADHD is a harbinger of things to come. And the child with ADHD in the future will be developing other conditions. And if you have a, uh, a rating scale like the child behavior checklist that's given to the child, say, once a year, then you basically you can start to monitor when those symptoms, if and when they emerge. And then we can start to treat the child sooner for, say, depression or anxiety, as, as opposed to waiting until they become crippling and imp very impairing problems. It's one of the biggest problems in child psychiatry and psychology is that you know, the time between onset of symptoms and treatment uh, is typically very, very long. We did a study once when I was at Mass General that was, I think the average time between onset and treatment was six years, uh, wow. which is a long time in the life of a young person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I suppose for us in the UK, the guidelines say, when you think about the age that we can diagnose anyway, it's, it's from the age of six. The, That's, right. Of, That's right. Of course, the symptoms would have been the onset of the symptoms would have been before that, but um, and certainly due to the shortage of um, you know the pressures that we have in waiting lists in the UK, that can result in the individual having to wait for months and years and years. In exactly, some cases, that, actually, just, that, that just worsens all the delays that you have. Absolutely, exactly. So, are you, are you currently working on any particular research that you might want to share with us currently? Uh, a lot of my work now is focusing on uh, predictive modeling. Can you predict? Uh, onset of disorders or outcomes from either uh, genomic data and or medical record data. That's kind of my goal right now in the next 10 years is to try to come up with a, a predictive model that's actually useful in clinical practice. The ideal model would be one where you could essentially, because nowadays, for example, uh, it's, it's very inexpensive to get a genomic sample. Pretty soon they'll be done routinely where you get a blood sample and for maybe $100, Max, you have the person's full genome uh, uh, on a computer chip and can have that information available to predict potential future medical problems that they might have, including psychiatric problems. We can't do it yet. Right now, the predictive accuracy is just too low. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm thinking that if we improve our modeling methods using complex methods from machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, and if we combine that with medical record data, information about the child's history, uh, then we may be able to predict who are the kids that are at highest risk and, and get them to treatment early, early on. And and so you're talking not just ADHD, you're talking about general psychiatry. Uh, well, it's it would be relevant to general psychiatry. My, my big focus yeah. now is in ADHD. I have published some papers on predicting suicidality since that's right. such a, a serious outcome as, as right. well. But yeah, we, we, we'll definitely branch out beyond ADHD, but that's a starting point for me because it's my interest. Yeah, of course. And if there was to be any way of predicting in terms of treatment wise, you talked about blood tests there to know what, um, sorry, sorry, I just turned down my microphone to know which uh, treatment or medication they might respond ah, to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a great question too, because uh, it's one, it's, it's another area that I've been working on a little bit where, um, at a project with this new non-stimulant I mentioned, extended release fluoxetine, where yeah. one of the problems with the non-stimulants is that they, unlike a stimulant, a stimulant will start to work in a week or two. Non-stimulant can take six to eight weeks before you're sure that it's actually working. And that presents a hurdle to, to patients and prescribers because um, typically people like shorter you know, response rates, shorter times for response rates to occur, especially if the child's in school. Um, so one one thing I did with extended release fluoxetine, I showed that we could actually predict after two weeks which um, patients would go on to have a good response six weeks later. And so theoretically, if this model was adopted, a prescriber could 
use this drug and essentially after two weeks know which patient should stop and which patient should continue. And for the most part, do a pretty good job of accurately making that identification. Uh, yeah. It would be a way to, it's another, it's another way to kind of reduce this problem of stimulant diversion is to have more people on non-stimulants because currently the, the current guideline that has stimulants being tried first, uh, it's a good guideline because the stimulants are on average more effective than the non-stimulants. That's the main reason why we have that guideline. Um, but what that guideline kind of misunderstands is that there are some people who do very well on a non-stimulant. And if you always start with a stimulant, then the patient doesn't have a chance to do very well on a non-stimulant. And then they have to, you know, for the rest of their life, they'll be on a stimulant, which again, was good for their ADHD, but it creates other headaches in terms of regular, you know, the regulations and uh, also in terms of the potentials for diversion and, and so forth. Yeah, so. I, I think I think for us, obviously, because I prescribe as well, if we have the time to titrate, even for someone who's on stimulants, um, we know that sometimes just, uh, titrating and stabilizing someone can take a good few months to get to that point one part of it is because we haven't got the time to to see people more more regularly to closely monitor people and get the rating scales completed and get regular right. feedback essentially because obviously with stimulants they work fairly quickly we don't have to wait there don't have to be a period of having to wait for a month for you exactly. to then make a difference exactly. so so, yeah, so I think, but the guidelines don't actually help as well because they don't they don't actually give as much guidelines in terms of how the titration is much more of a general overview, really, without really specifically saying you can actually change the dose within three days. <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so yeah, um, but th that's another subject for another time. So, so lastly, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, in terms of like, just if there is anything else you want to maybe make our listeners aware that. Um, that you're I, working I, I on? Or... We've covered everything. Um, I'll give a shout out again to my website, adhdevidence.org, because I am trying to educate the public uh, okay. about ADHD. I've got a lot of blogs, videos. For people who like to teach about ADHD, I also provide free uh, downloadable PowerPoint slides that cover, um, I think we have over 350 now uh, that are based on the international consensus statement on ADHD, which is also posted at that website which anybody interested in ADHD should read because it covers the main findings um, in ADHD research over the past decades. Excellent. So it's ADHDevidence.org, O-R-G. Dot, dot O-R-G, yes. Right. O-R-G, yeah, excellent, perfect. Are you on, on social media platforms at all? Yeah, I'm on Twitter and uh, yeah, at, my Twitter handle is at Stephen Ferrone, LinkedIn under my name. Uh, also on Threads, although I think Threads, it's not my name. We just under under ADHD evidence, something like that. Okay, I forget. And I forget. What, yeah. Okay, all right. I'm sure, we'll find you. I'll, I'll put the links in our in the podcast description anyway. But it's put. Uh, but yeah, no. I'll put the I'll put the Twitter. Let me just put this in the chat. Actually, the Twitter. Okay. Yeah. The Twitter is uh, just my name. It's Twitter's at. Or it's not Twitter anymore, right? It's that stupid X. Oh, X. I know. Yeah, I know. Can't get run with that name. To be fair. <laughs> I know it's ridiculous. That's that's the Twitter handle there. I think LinkedIn. I, I think LinkedIn. If you just search for my name, you'll, they'll find me there. Um, and they can yeah, you know, just send a follow request. I accept. I've that. got yeah. That's how yeah. we started talking. I think that was via LinkedIn, didn't we? So I've got yeah. your LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, that's fine. And let, me, let me just see if I can find. Hold on a second here. Uh, hold on a second. Hmm. Well, that's fine. Yeah, that people, if people have that information, they can, you know, they'll, because I, I post all my announcements about blogs uh, on the, um, my Twitter and LinkedIn. So they'll get information yeah. about that. For sure. And whereabouts in the States are you are you based? Um, uh, SUNY Upstate Medical University is in Syracuse, New York. That's in like northern New York, close to Canada, actually. Oh, wow. wow. Okay. All right. Excellent. So do you ever come to the UK at all? I do periodically. I haven't been there in a while. Um, it's like, what was the last time I was there? Gosh, that no, was, I mean, I traveled a bit in, in uh, different parts of the UK. With pleasure and, and work. I was I was invited to come speak 
at a meeting, I think it was a UCAN meeting in, in, in the spring, but I couldn't do it because of a conflict. Um, but I do come to the UK periodically, but I, not for a while. Excellent. I think the, I think yeah. the next Unithite, next Unithite is meeting, or maybe it was in Cardiff last year. I think I might have missed the Cardiff meeting. I was planning to go to the Cardiff meeting, uh, but that was canceled because of COVID. So I missed that meeting there. Yeah. yeah. And any conferences that you are presenting in 2024 to look out for? Well, I'll be at the US, uh, it's called the APSARD meeting, American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders. That's in January. Um, that's the big meeting. That's the only thing I have on my schedule right now, I believe. I might present, some, I haven't decided yet about the U. I probably won't go to the US Child Psychiatry meeting this year. I sometimes present at that meeting, but um, it, this in Seattle, Washington, which is kind of far away, so I might I might skip that. Yeah, yeah, okay. And 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 do you see children and adults, or do you specialize in just children? Well, I actually don't see patients anymore. And I've, I've, oh, right. now, nowadays, I devote my life entirely to research. Um, right. But when I did see patients, I, I saw both children and adults. Um, yeah. Back when I was nowadays, psychologists will tend to specialize in ch children, you know, ch child or adult. But back when I was being trained. Kind of learn to do it all. <laughs> it was, uh... Yeah, yeah. And lastly, the question I was going to ask you just—I think you touched on before about neuropsychiatry, no, no neuropsychiatry, neuro neuropsychology assessments. Do you do you see the value in uh, a young person or even an adult having one done, particularly if they're putting themselves forward for an ADHD assessment? Because obviously, there's so much that can you can get from that that might mimic or present as ADHD. Yeah, I think it's. Um... I, well, I worry about it being used diagnostically because right. the way I think about it is this way is right is that that person's coming for a diagnosis. So if we assume that they've been medically cleared, that they don't have a neurological problem, they don't have, you know, another medical condition that's accounting for the ADHD. At that point, it's when it's determined it's a mental health issue, I think the next appropriate step is for the clinician to make a diagnosis. I don't see the neuropsychological test, I don't see that it's going to help, right? Because it's at that point, I mean, maybe you have an experience where it has helped you, and I'd be happy to hear about that. But in my experience, they really neuropsychological testing has has never been really useful for making a diagnosis. It's been very useful for helping figure out what to do with the patient after their first wave of treatment is stabilized. Because at that point, in in a sense, you somehow gain more. Really, if you think about it this way, right? If you if you if you give the testing before treatment. It's the results are going to be all confounded by the ADHD is very active and this and that, right? But if you give it after you stabilize them on medication, then you see how they're doing. And then you can you can realize areas of life, areas of their cognitive life, which are not being helped by the medication. And that might give, give one ideas about other things to do or yeah. other things to monitor. Possibly it could give a clue to maybe they have another disorder, but that's that would be very rare, I think. Yeah. It'd be very unusual. I mean, you know, Kate, in a rare event, you know, neuropsychologists might come back and say, I think he has epilepsy. But I mean, that's right. going to be rare. And I think right. for the most part, the neuropsychologists are probably wrong because the tests aren't actually that accurate for yeah. um, making neurological diagnoses. Yeah. Um, but you, you, so you, you're not going to lose that, that diagnostic information if it's, in, in those rare cases, you'll still get it. But then the neuropsychological testing you get after treatment is stabilized is much more useful because the, the testing before treatment is just, you know, they might do they might do terribly just because they're not, they, they haven't taken medication yet. Yeah. And once they take yeah. the medication, they might do fine on the testing, in which case yeah. you're not worried. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does your research ever extend to like looking at the link between trauma, uh, attachment issues, particularly yeah, in the My ADHD. research doesn't, it, it doesn't. Um, it's trauma is an interesting area because I don't know how it is in the UK, but in the, unfortunately in the US, trauma has become kind of a, what we call a cottage industry, that people become trauma specialists and then everything becomes trauma induced when they see somebody who's had a traumatic event. And yeah. it's actually caused some problems in the United States because, because there's some of these trauma people won't diagnose a disorder if they say, oh no, this isn't ADHD, this person has, you know, is has been traumatized. We have to give them, they need trauma-informed therapy to solve their problems. And that's a mistake because 
people with ADHD can be traumatized. They can have tooth problems, right? They can have ADHD and they can be traumatized because, for example, ADHD makes it more likely you're going to be into an accident, serious accident. Serious accidents cause trauma. ADHD, yeah. you know, believe it or not, there's there's also this problem, not a problem, but it's just the reality of science that um, with this new genomic data that we collect, it's possible to uh, do experiments like the following, which I didn't do, but someone else did, where they basically took genomic samples from a general population, I forget where it was, somewhere in Europe, doesn't matter. Uh, but they weren't selected for having a disorder, just kids in the community, some with a problem, some without a problem. They took their DNA and they uh, evaluated from their DNA their genetic risk for ADHD. And what they found is that the child genetic risk for ADHD correlated with was what well, was higher for children who had been exposed to sexual abuse, physical child abuse, uh, who grew up in, in poverty, uh, who basically were in a lot of traumatic, ex who had experienced different types of traumas. We call that gene environment correlation, that our genes are correlated with our environment. So um, it's a mistake to think trauma as something very separate and as traumatic ADHD from being different from idiopathic ADHD, because it's probably the case in many cases that the trauma didn't cause the ADHD. The person had ADHD, they were traumatized, and now they have two problems. They have, they yeah. have traumatic, they have PTSD, and they have ADHD, and both need to be treated. So anyway, that's that's my yeah. view of that kind of issue. No, 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 so, I, I completely agree. And that's something that we still face in the UK, where, um, like what you said about some clinicians actually saying, putting it down, as soon as they see trauma, they think it's down to that. There is an ADHD, right. and you can't separate the two. And we haven't got the test that will be able to say, no, nope, yeah, this is trauma, this is ADHD, or it's a. It's, it just doesn't well, make sense. I mean, it's like it's like saying no. a child has autism, they can't have ADHD. We used to say that, right? That that was the requirement, yeah. you know, yeah. a few years ago. If you had yeah. autism, you couldn't have ADHD, which was ridiculous. And now, yeah. you know, now it's um, now the diagnostic manual has caught up with reality. But yeah, of course, people and anybody can have PTSD. It's just because. Yeah. Uh, but people with people who have underlying uh, people who actually have a psychiatric problem like ADHD are more likely to be traumatized. Same thing with bipolar disorder. If you have bipolar disorder, you're more. There's a lot of people who think, for example, that bipolar disorder in kids is all due to trauma, because there are there are data showing these kids have a lot of traumatic events. But people yeah. who have studied it closely show that the kids who have the bipolar disorder, the trauma frequently comes after the bipolar disorder onset because pe kids with bipolar disorder put themselves in traumatic situations. That's it. I think what, what, what makes it complex is how the symptoms present. I suppose if you look at someone who, maybe a young person has gone through trauma and they're presenting with a lot of behavioral challenges or there's a lot of mistrust and um, emotional dysregulation, which again could be ADHD related, but I can see why some clinicians can look at it and kind of go, mm, I'm not too sure about this. It, yeah. How how confident can they be in that situation to go? Yep, it sounds ADHD because because of this well, overlap. See, the, see, my uh, my my approach is really to try to simplify. Right, is to say, yeah. one evaluates the range of psychopathology. If someone someone comes in, they're traumatized. For example, if they meet criteria for depression, most trauma people are going to say they're depressed. They're not going to say, "Well, I wonder if this is really depression." They're going to say, "No, this per this person is actually yeah. depressed," and that's because yeah. it's actually because of their underlying belief structure, because they believe that depression is a real disorder that they can diagnose and they're comfortable diagnosing, so they diagnose it. But if the person meets criteria for ADHD, all of a sudden they become suspicious of it. They say, oh, well, maybe it's not ADHD, maybe it's trauma. And it's actually kind of, but that's kind of ridiculous because you're treating those two disorders differently and you shouldn't. Um, my, my approach is, is very much of, you diagnose all the disorders the patient has. And then at, you look at those disorders and you say, Okay, what is my, what does this tell me about how I need to do, how I have to treat this patient? And the answer to that is, well, you find out which which disorder is causing the most impairment, and which disorder, and you you kind of cross that with what treatments are available. And frequently, the ADHD is causing a lot of impairments, and it's very it's very treatable. And so to not treat it is it becomes a huge mistake, right? Because if you end up putting somebody in trauma uh, informed psychotherapy for ten years, and then they finally get treatment for ADHD and it works, but well, you've made a huge mistake, right? Because the person's been disabled for 10 years when they don't have to be disabled for 10 years. So it's, 
I think we're better off making the diagnoses. And because if you think about it, there's nothing about trauma that is going to cause a full syndrome of ADHD. Uh, it's just not, except for traumatic brain injury. That's a special, that's a special case of uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's about the same, uh, yeah, separate. You, you, you look at the symptoms, if they are, I suppose if there's a case where there's absence of the, 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 the history, particularly if the child is adopted or they're no longer with the birth family, it can be hard to actually obtain the um, the early history, particularly family history as well could be absent. That's right. So, no, the, of course, in the real world, you, you face all these problems of not knowing, right? What, what's yeah. the history? What's it like? And that's when you're stuck with the, you know, diagnosing a, uh, you know, kind of having a provisional working diagnosis and then maybe, yeah. and that's, that's, I, I, I will agree with you there. Then it can be difficult uh, to know. Mm -hmm. Same thing with adult that comes in who's a bad reporter and, you know, they seem to have ADHD, but you can't actually document a childhood onset. And there, um, I, I always would tend to err on the side of, you know, treating the disorder that seemed evident. Because if you treat the ADHD, because if, if, if you don't treat something you can treat, that's a huge mistake. If you treat something, if you treat a disorder and you make a mistake in treating it, you'll figure that out pretty soon for the most part. Uh, because, you know, if, if a person is just as a traumatic as PTSD and they don't have ADHD, if you give them, you know, you give them the Lizdex amphetamine, they might feel a little better, but they're not going to, it is not going to help them dramatically like most people, like it helps people with ADHD. I'm not saying that you should use drugs to test the diagnosis, but it is the reality in the case of the, these difficult cases. Sometimes you have yeah. to treat. Um, uh, but, you know, it's this This is an area where there's just no guidelines. And it's very, it's, it's not, you'll find other experts telling you something very different. They'll say, oh no, you wouldn't want to treat that person because- yeah. Um, you know, Certainly. exposing them to a dangerous drug and, and so forth and so on. I always think that the failing to treat a very treatable disorder is a big mistake. That's why I, that's, how, that's my yeah. logic behind my thinking. Which is why in some cases you see the objective testing coming in or being used, like, such as the QB test and the Tolvers and the CPTs for some, in some, in some practices anyway, to be able to, for, to reassure the, the clinician to say, yeah, yeah that's it's right. It's, that's that's the that's a good that's a good term for it. Reassurance. They use reassurance. That actually can't. That actually can't. Well, I take that back. There's there's one test called the I think it's the NEBA. N E B A. It's another one okay. of these. I forgot how. It's another one. Is it's either a CPT or an EEG based test. It's another one that's approved by the US FDA, and they did a very clever uh, approach where instead of just saying this is useful for as an adjunct for diagnosis, they did some studies showing that for difficult cases. It was useful for, uh, in some cases, you know, for to help clinicians kind of make a diagnosis, um, but it, it it hasn't been studied so much that we can really kind of say it's ready to use on a on a regular on a regular basis. Yeah. But, um, yeah. People again, people need to be comfortable. But again, let's say, I mean, think of the good example. Let's say so you have an adult that comes in; they're a bad reporter. They seem to have full blown ADHD. Uh, it's destroying their life they can't work they're they're about to get divorced they everything about them looks classically adhd and maybe they have an adhd brother that runs in the family but they don't meet the full diagnostic criteria most people are going to treat the adhd because it's even though they can't document the child at onset because it's an eminently treatable disorder and to not to fail to treat something you can treat is 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 a huge is would be a huge mistake um now, but again, of course, I'm ignoring. I'm ignoring the possibility of somebody is trying to simulate symptoms of ADHD because of other things, and that's that's another problem. Yeah, I think from what I see with clinicians, I think there's there's no consistency with what you just said there, where the absence of uh, childhood history in some cases, the adult isn't been they won't actually carry on with the assessment or let alone give a diagnosis. Some some clinicians, like what you said there, where you can clearly see the symptoms. And the the adult is struggling, so you treat what you can see. The symptoms are there, as much as they weren't able to report in terms of their childhood history, or no one was able to co collaborate in terms of provide evidence in terms of how they were in childhood. So, we, you know, we see some of our patients are in their sixties, seventies. So, right. one, they haven't got full memory of what their childhood history was like. Certainly, in terms of ADHD, the that's not something that was spoken about or that was ever questioned when they were younger. They might have That's described right. issues around concentration, focusing, hyperactivity, and things, but 
not necessarily it being raised to ADHD. So, yeah. so yeah, it, it's, yeah. But unless once we go back to the point of what I was saying about once we have a test, which is objective enough to say this is a blood test, it confirms, yes, there's a there's a gene in, in you or a, a chemical in your brain that's linked to ADHD. Until we get to that point, we're still going to have these issues around discrepancies. Right. Yeah. We're going to still have these issues and it's still going to be clinical experience and clinical savvy that that makes these yeah. very tough decisions sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Sure. Professor Farron, thanks for your time. Absolute nice pleasure to have to you, you on. Yeah. And, and you. Enjoy your Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. And yeah, I will, um, I'll send you the link once we've edited the podcast so you can listen and share as well. Sounds good. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you. I will, I will Thank share it in my social media. That will be, that will okay, be amazing. Thank you. Take care. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.